fortunately, I have had to um, do a lot of these instead of my usual in-person um, walks through the woods, um, looking at trees and shrubs and, and up close and personal. Um, and through this process of doing webinars, um, I had a couple times where um, I had the ability to sit and think about what I was going to do and how I was going to make the connection that I normally would make in person over the internet. Um, and I decided that one of the things that I was going to commit to um, was I was not going to teach Arbor Culture 101 anymore. Um, I was not going to um, bring it down, bring the level of knowledge down because education to me is, is I could sit here for three or four hours and talk about trees. I, I could do that all day. I've been doing this for 35 years. The point I think uh, that, that's important about education is that this kind of event, this webinar situation here, triggers an interest in you to learn. And so tonight you're gonna hear technical terms. You're gonna hear things that you may not have heard before and comments made about trees and shrubs that you've never heard uh, made before. And I hope um, that in the long run, at the end of this, that it triggers your desire to learn more because that's what this is about. Um, when we're talking about trees and shrubs, we are talking about a renewable resource, but not one that is going to come within a decade. Um, you've got a hundred year old oak that needs to be taken care of or it will die. It's going to take you a hundred years to replace that tree. So it's really important that people get a better grasp of tree knowledge. Um, and I think that is out there. I think that desire to learn is out there. This speaks well, uh, 25, 30 people, whatever we have here tonight, that speaks well of homeowners' interest and people's interest in trees and shrubs. If I can get, there we go. So a lot of people ask me why I do this. I've been teaching now for about 15 years. Um, and this is basically why, because there is a desire to know about this. Um, there is a desire for, for an understanding of the urban forest. And for the most part, people want to maintain the forest. They want to grow it. They want it to be a living, vibrant thing that's part of their neighborhood or part of their city. And that has been going on for years. But unfortunately, the information to, to make it happen, to make it better, has not. And so I got into teaching about 15 years ago um, to enable people to learn more about the urban forest and, and to learn about it correctly and to understand it, um, not just its importance, but how to take care of it and how to expand it, All right? So getting into technical aspects here, let's, let's just go ahead and do that. All tree species, regardless of what they are, and this is for um, shrubs as well, we'll say in general, for chlorophyll producing plants. All species have defense mechanisms. Now we know for a fact that they're not always effective, but they do exist. There are tree species that have very strong defense mechanisms and there are others that have weaker defense mechanisms. Ornamental trees or trees that are created. You hear the term, when discussing trees, you hear the term cultivar. All a cultivar is, is a tree that's been created by man. What is an example of that? Probably the most um, well-known or common cultivar tree that has been created into multiple cultivars is crab apple. But next on the list is red maple. Red maple is listed as a native tree to the state of Michigan, and there are native red maples. 
The difference is when you have a cultivar on the tag, when you go to a nursery to buy a red maple, on the tag will be a name after a cerebrum. It will say a cerebrum October glory, a cerebrum red sunset. That is red maple, red sunset. Red sunset means that tree is a cultivar. If it is a native tree, it will only have the Latin term on the tag. There will be no, um, we'll call it an ornamental name for lack of a better term. And that would be the name Red Sunset or October Glory. That means those trees have been created in a laboratory. They've been created by man. And as a result of that, they have weaker defense mechanisms. Why is that? In a lot of cases, it is because those ornamental cultivated trees are grafted. They take the root system of one tree and right inside the bark, they stick a stem. It's a process called cleft grafting. And that root system heals around that stem and that stem picks up some of the DNA of that root system. Nine out of 10 times they're using a root system from a tree that grows in a very specific way in order to make that stem grow in that very specific way. So you can see what they're doing here. They're alternating, uh, I shouldn't say alternating, they're altering the DNA of the tree to make it do something they want it to do. Whether that is to grow in a nice symmetrical shape, um, to stay smaller than the native version of a tree. You've heard the term dwarf trees. Those are grafted trees. So ornamental trees that are grafted have to expend a lot of resources in that grafting process. The root system has to heal around the stem. The stem has to become part of that root system. That all requires great amount of energy. And so ornamentally created trees don't have the defense mechanisms of native trees because they're spending a higher percentage of resources in the healing process and merging with the other tree that they have been grafted to, right? So a little complex there, but to understand the difference between defense mechanisms of native trees and defense mechanisms of ornamental trees, it's important to understand why those differences exist, right? So let's talk about a situation, and, and this is weird, but the top of this slide, in fact, um, the last one was the same way. I don't know why, but it's being cut off here. Oh, sorry um, to interrupt you, Gary. We're not seeing your slide. You need to share it with us. Really? Yeah. Uh -oh. Sorry, I should have picked up on that sooner. Uh -oh, let's see. I wonder what happened. You know what? Now I see it. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, right. All right, so I talked about the ornamental, the difference between ornamental trees and native trees. And ornamental is, is a created or a cultivated kind of tree, right? So when you have that situation, you have a tree that is expending more resources than normal because of that situation. And so the resources can't be put to defense. And that's why they have a weaker defense system, All right? Now, this situation is, is one that has been um, mistaken for years. And like I said, I don't know why the top of this is being cut off, but it is. This is an explanation of Dutch elm disease. And Dutch elm disease is a virulent fungus that enters the tree and is brought into the tree by a small beetle called the elm bark beetle. He feeds an infected tree 
And then some of the fungus gets on his mouth part, his mouth parts or his feet. He goes to an uninfected tree, feeds a little bit at a branch and deposits the fungus in the tree. And that's how um, the trees become infected. And over time, they can, you can see in this picture that trees root graft. Trees of the same species root graft. Now it's very rare that a red oak would graft with a white oak. Red oaks would graft with other red oaks, but they very rarely graft out of species. So here you have two American elms and that disease can be passed through that root grafting process. But what I really wanted to talk here about is the defense mechanism that the American elm uses when it senses the presence of Dutch elm disease in the tree. Dutch elm disease does not kill the American elm. The American elm kills itself. It actually commits suicide because it uses its defense mechanisms to send down enzymes and proteins through the vascular system to block the pathway of the disease because the disease is in that vascular tissue, that conductive tissue of the tree. And so by the tree blocking that vascular tissue, it's also blocking the water flow up through the tree. So as the disease expands and moves into other parts of the vascular system, the tree reacts by sending down enzymes and proteins to block the pathway of that fungus. And in doing so, it's also blocking the water conductive tissue of the tree. And so the tree ends up committing suicide by blocking the water tissue that it needs to move water through the tree. So it's a complex issue, but I wanted to show you a defense mechanism. Now, this is a defense mechanism that ends up being overwhelmed by the fungus. And the fungus of Dutch elm disease replicates extremely quickly with inside the tree. And that's why the tree has to respond so quickly to try to stop that growth and block the advance of the fungus and it just does not work. So this is a defense mechanism that is there, but it's also a defense mechanism that doesn't function as it should, All right? Here's another one. This is an Austrian pine and it's being attacked by bark beetles. Bark beetles are drilling into the tree. Whenever an opening in a tree occurs, that tree knows it because oxygen enters the tree as a hole is made or a split occurs in the trunk, oxygen enters that split or enters that hole. So here we have a bark beetle female who is drilling into the tree to make her nest. The tree senses that because oxygen is entering the tree, it sends down sap to that point to block that oxygen, to close that hole. And in the process, if the female beetle is in that hole when that sap arrives, the beetle is suffocated. So this is a defense mechanism that can be very effective, but the beetle also has a defense mechanism to keep it from getting suffocated. Behind its head, it has an aperture that it can open and release a fungus into the tree that blocks the sap from reaching the hole. This is called blue stain or black stain fungus. So the beetle has, an, has the ability to overcome the defense mechanism with one of its own defense mechanisms. Unfortunately, what ends up happening is that fungus never stops growing until the tree is completely dead. And then the blue stain or the black stain fungus, whichever one the beetle happens to be carrying, is um, it dies because it has nothing to feed on. So here you have a tree with an excellent defense mechanism that the beetle can actually counter if it has enough time to. And these are very common in Austrian pines. We're going to take a look at Austrian pines here in a few minutes. 
and they are not well adapted to Michigan at all. And as a result of that, while they're young, they have great defense mechanisms. As they get older, those defense mechanisms drop very quickly. So how do you get a tree that has strong defense mechanisms? You first choose the right species or cultivars for two reasons, for location and soil conditions. And it's really important. Soil conditions are extremely important. You can get a soil test done through Michigan State, which is our land grant university for $10. And it can tell you the basics of what your soil contains. And then you can pick a tree that will work in those existing soil conditions. The other part, location, is based on, is, is it a very wet spot? Then you buy a species of a tree that likes wet conditions. Or is it full sun? then you have to buy a species of a tree that has a high percentage of sun. So you are looking, those are the two main purposes, or excuse me, main reasons for choosing the tree, soil conditions and location, right? Keep trees watered during stressful periods. Usually in Michigan, we get enough rain in the spring and in the fall. This year, we've gotten enough rain through the entire year, practically. Um, in June, we had 21 days of rain, which never happens in Michigan. So we have had a lot of, of, of rainfall this year, and you probably would not need to water trees hardly at all this year. But in most cases, uh, Michigan does go dry in July and August, and so you need to water. But as an urban forester and an arborist, the number one cause of death of plant material in the state of Michigan is overwatering. Um, it is a very common problem. It can bring on soil pathogens that will kill your plants outright. Uh, overwatering is, uh, is exceptionally, is, is one of the worst things that you can do to plant material. Let me give you an example here. I'm a member of the Royal Society of Boxwoods. It's, it's just a bunch of people that are really into boxwoods. I am not really into boxwoods, but being an urban forester, I thought I would join so that we, I could discuss boxwoods with people. The recommendation for boxwoods is to water them once a year. Most people water boxwoods once a day. Uh, we see boxwoods planted right next to lawns, watered with the irrigation system of the lawn. Uh, Overwatering boxwoods is almost a guarantee that at some point you're going to kill them. They do not tolerate wet feet, as we call it in the business. So it, we have an issue with overwatering. Proper mulching, proper, proper pruning, proper insect and disease control. These are all important because if you're asking the tree to expend more resources than it should, you are, the tree is immediately taking those resources away from defense. It is using them to survive. If you pile mulch against the trunk in what we call a mulch volcano, you are stressing the trunk of the tree. If you're overwatering, you're stressing the plant. If you're incorrectly pruning the plants, you're stressing the plants. Anything that increases stress takes away from defense because that's how the tree reallocates resources. The first thing it does is take resources away from defense. All right, so I wanted to talk about um, a couple of diseases that are often mistaken for leaf scorch or drought stress. Um, leaf spot disease has come in a myriad of patterns. I've chosen one here, this is Septoria leaf spot but there is a multitude of leaf spot diseases. The one on the left, rose black spot, is actually a leaf spot fungi. And a lot of times people see this on their plants and they think it's a result of drought stress and so they begin watering. Here's the problem. These diseases are moved by irrigation water, not rainwater, but irrigation water. Why? because most city water, in fact, all city water is treated. And so the pH level of that water is very high. It's usually around seven, seven and a half. 
rainwater is acidic. It's about 4.5, 5, 5.5 in there. So the difference is fungi do not like acidic water. So if you take your garden hose and you start watering these plants and get the leaves wet, you can actually move the disease. You can make it worse because the fungi will begin replicating in that alkaline water, in that high pH water that comes from the city. So if you have a rain barrel, it is much better to water your plants with water from the rain barrel, even though there's a potential for some toxic elements because the water has come off of asphalt shingles and it will sometimes pull some of the chemicals out of old asphalt shingles. It's still better for most plants. The ultimate is to not get the leaves wet, to use ground irrigation and to just get the soil wet and water the root system and not get the leaves wet at all with any type of water. It's the best way to prevent these types of diseases. And nowadays too, I should mention that you can buy roses that are resistant. Um, in most cases, any rose that's red is not resistant and any rose that's pink is not resistant. So you can have real issues with those if you're growing red or pink roses. And I grow uh, Queen Elizabeth roses. So I have to treat my roses every year for black spot. This is probably the most common uh, leaf spot fungi there is. This is called apple scab and it attacks crab apples and apples. And it is a probably one of the more unique fungi in the world. Um, fungi replicate, and I've, I've used that term a couple times here, they replicate very quickly for the most part. But they either replicate one of two ways. They replicate through a process called mitosis, which is literally cell division. The, the fungi cells simply separate. One cell becomes two, two cells become four, and they replicate that way. Or they replicate sexually. There's actually male fungi and female fungi, but they only have one method of replication. It's either the asexual version, which is called mitosis, or the sexual version. Apple scab replicates both ways, and so it makes it a very difficult disease to control because it starts early and it goes for a very long time. The infection period for apple scab is from bud break in the spring, which in Michigan is usually late April. This year it was much earlier. It was, I think, two to three weeks earlier than normal. And that infection period runs mid to late June. During this time, the fungi is replicating. It starts off in an asexual type of replication in mitosis. And then around Memorial Day weekend, it looks like the disease has stopped. Your tree doesn't seem to be getting any worse. Well, what's happening is that fungi is actually morphing. It's evolving into its sexual variant, and then it hits again. And just after Memorial Day weekend, and the effects can be devastating. This is a tree infected with primary infection of apple scab. And you see what basically happens is the interior leaves, the established leaves are the ones that fall off the tree. The tree gets very thin. You shouldn't be able to see through a crab apple like this. So this asexual infection occurs basically inside the tree. So you're looking at it and you're saying, okay, well, it doesn't seem to be getting any worse. Um, I lost a bunch of leaves, but it seems to have stabilized. This is what will end up happening after Memorial Day weekend as the sexual variant now has morphed from the asexual into the sexual and almost complete defoliation curves. Now, this can be easily treated with two to three applications of disease control on the tree. And I have, I don't think, I have yet to see a crab apple die as a result of apple scab alone. They, as you can see, they, they become very unsightly. 
not aesthetically pleasing at all because trees in mid-June are supposed to have leaves on them in Michigan. And unfortunately, it's almost complete defoliation in a tree that has no resistance to that disease. Now, having said that, there are 128 cultivars of crabapple for sale in the northern region and in, in what we call zone five and zone six, which is Michigan, the lower peninsula of Michigan. So you got 128 to choose from. But of that, there's only about 40 that are very resistant to this disease. So the first thing I recommend is if you want a crab apple, check to find out if it's resistant to apple scab. And a lot of them will say it on the tag on the tree, but there is also a list. Ohio State University has a very extensive list and they have an extension website called Ohio Line where you can go and put that in their search engine and you can come up with a very good list of the crab apples that are resistant to apple scab. So you have this foliar disease. So what happens here? This tree is an incredible stress. It is not storing any sugars and carbohydrates because it has no leaves. All those branches are overheating and they are. this tree is becoming stressed to very high levels. So what does that mean? Apple scab is not capable of killing this tree. However, under those stressful conditions, two other diseases are very capable of entering the tree. On the left, we have a disease called Botrytis fera canker. Um, abbreviate that one. Bot canker works really well. You don't have to remember that incredibly long name. It is pronounced Botrytis fera. And it is a vascular disease of a lot of tree species. But in this case, this is a picture of a red bud infected with Botrytis fera, but it also infects crab apples. On the right is a, is a um, disease, a vascular disease called Nectaria canker. This one is not quite as destructive or potentially fatal, but as you can see, it very, very well disfigures a tree. It, uh, this is called target canker because it looks kind of like a gun target once it forms on the tree. The tree can also become very brittle at this point and break, uh, but it doesn't move through the tree the way Botrytis fera will. Um, and so what happens when trees are stressed are these other types of disease that can get into them and, and cause fatality. Okay, so that's part of understanding why you need to control um, a disease like apple scab, because it causes stress in the tree that can allow these types of disease to get into them. All right, so I promised a little um, trip into the wonderful world of Austrian pines. If I could tell you straight out to not buy Austrian pines and not plant Austrian pines, I will. In fact, I just did. Um, I, these trees have absolutely no value. Now this, you're looking at this tree and you're saying, Gary, this is a beautiful tree. This tree is about six, eight, maybe 10, 12 years at the oldest, right? So when they are young, yes, they are very good. They were brought into this country in the mid sixties as a replacement for arborvitae, that they were actually screening trees because they were so thick um, that they could be planted right next to each other, uh, which is totally untrue, but they were planted right next to each other. And as a result of that, at this age, they look wonderful. They're a beautiful tree. Here's the problem with Austrian pines. We say the name Austrian. This is actually a European black pine, but they do have them growing in Austria. It's Austria, Germany, Czechoslovakia, Romania, a lot of Central Europe and Northern Europe. These trees also grow in Switzerland, in Sweden and Finland, right? So at first they were brought in from nurseries in those areas, but the demand in the United States for this tree, they could not keep up with it. And so they had to start looking farther afield for more Austrian pines. There is another strain of this tree, not cultivated, literally another strain, which you don't say very much about trees. You're usually talking genera, family, species, 
right? In this case, it's a completely different strain that grows in Egypt, Libya, Sicily, the boot of Italy. They found Austrian pines growing down there, and so they shipped those to the United States. Well, here's the problem. If you have a tree that's coming from Austria, you have one that can basically deal with Michigan winters. You bring in an Austrian pine from Egypt or Morocco, and odds are it's not going to make Michigan winters very well. And that's what's happened. Most of the trees we now have growing in the northern regions of the United States are unfortunately from the strain of the southern version. And so they are very weak. They get very stressed out by Michigan winters. They begin to decline at 15 to 18 years of age. And the list on the left is not all inclusive. This is not everything that can attack an Austrian pine in Michigan. But you can see it's a very long list. And these trees can be disfigured very, very quickly. This is what a tree looks like with severe diplodia tip line. Now, why does it do this? This is Newton's law of gravity. The fungus infects the tree at the top in the pine cones, and we're actually going to see a picture of those infected pine cones. And then as the spores are released from the pine cone, they simply drop down. And so the lower branches get infected first, then the disease travels back into the trunk, and passes systemically through the water conductive tissue of the tree. And over the course of eight to 10 to 15 years, if the tree is stressed enough, it will become 100% infected. As a matter of fact, um, a doctor at the University of Kentucky took seeds from pine cones of infected Austrian pines, planted them, grew saplings, then took the saplings, ground them down, spun them, it's called Elijah testing, where you literally liquefy your sample. And he was able to find the disease in those saplings. In other words, the seeds from the pine cone pass the disease on. And so all Austrian pines that have been grown by seed in the last 20 years have literally been born with this disease in them. But it does not manifest itself until the tree begins producing pine cones at eight years of age. That's when an Austrian pine first starts producing pine cones. So the disease cannot show until those pine cones come out on the tree. This is what the disease first looks like as it begins to infect. It stunts the candles in those little white sheaths that hold the, the candles together is where the fungus actually is. Now you can see some spores out on the ends of these little stunted needles. The green needles are the ones that came out uninfected. But Diplodia tiplite stunts the growth of needles, killing them at a very early age. And then you can see the result. So the disease is, has a very short but extremely intense infection period. It's from early to mid-May, to early June, just before uh, the candles break, just before the new needles begin to come out. It infects that new, those new growth candles. Pines that have suffered repetitive infection, and this is self-infection. This disease can be airborne, but most of the time, it is the Austrian pine infecting itself. Its own pine cones have been infected, and it releases spores back into its own self, into the needles of its own tree, and keeps infecting and infecting and infecting. It can infect Austrian Scots red and some types of ornamental mugo pines. We're going to take a look at that in a second. The red pine, because it's native to Michigan, has much stronger defense mechanisms, and you very rarely see a very severe infection in a red pine. But Scots and Austrian are not native to Michigan, and as a result, they can be severely infected. And Amigo pine is a created pine, and so it can also be severely infected. This is a candle on the left that has repetitive infections. You can actually see how black it is from the spores. On the right, 
you can see that the pine cone is covered in spores. Those are the sheets of um, the pine cone. And those are spores that will eventually become active in the spring and literally slide off those sheaves and fall down to the needles on the tree and cause infection. Now, as I said earlier, that can be airborne because those spores can get blown to an adjacent tree. So if you have a screen or a group of four or five Austrian pines, they can infect each other and pass this disease on back and forth. It is a very problematic disease. It is potentially fatal to an Austrian pine that has been um, affected by not being from or not being adapted to a northern region. And as a result of that, the disease can get extremely bad. This is Diplodia tiplite in a bugle pine. And you can see it's a little different. The needles actually get to relatively full length um, before, they're be before they die and uh, turn to this orange color. So this is problematic um, in that a lot of people could think this is frost damage or uh, some type of environmental stress, possibly drought stress, and not realize that this is a disease. And so they come out and water the, the plant. And once again, high alkaline, or I shouldn't say high alkaline, but alkaline water conditions will spread this disease as well. So it, it becomes problematic. This disease, I am not a big fan of spraying to control this disease. Um, I have a few clients where I spray, but in most cases I am injecting for this disease where I inject the product directly into the trunk of the tree and fight the disease internally because this disease is for the most part an internal disease within the tree because it is a continual reinfection of itself. So you can see what happens here. And I don't know if you've ever noticed this with Austrian pines, but in their native habitat, they, and you saw that first picture of the young one, the branches are right to the ground. But here you see they're being limbed up. They're being limbed up because the lower branches die first because they're the longest. And so the cones open, drop the spores, they land on the branches that are the longest. And so you have the infection. And so businesses like this one will come out and prune off the brown branches and keep the trees as long as possible. So you see a lot of Austrian pines that have been limbed up as a result of being infected with diplodia. You also have the problem where if the fungus has been in the tree for repetitive years, and I am talking five to 10 years, it's become systemic and it's shutting down entire branches of the tree. And so that also will kill off um, entire branches. It's not just a disease working from the outside in, it's a disease working from the ground up. This is a picture, unfortunately, that I took. Um, I was on this property two days before this picture was taken. This happened in 48 hours. This is uh, in the village of Franklin, um, which I don't know if all of you folks are from Metro Detroit or not, uh, but the village of Franklin is basically, I think like Telegraph Road, 13 mile road, uh, about two miles north of 696. It's a small, um, rather high income area and they have a lot of Scots pine. And unfortunately this disease, which calling it a disease is kind of a misnomer, um, but uh, because it's caused by a nematode, uh, but it actually is more a disease than it is an insect because it's the replication of the insect that blocks the water conductive tissue of the tree. And in this case, um, the tree was infected at the time I went out to look at it two days prior. These needles were a light beige. 
and Mrs. was concerned. I, I said at the time that I felt that it was either bark beetle or pine wilt, but I had no idea that it was going to turn like this in 48 hours. This is um, amazing, but I later found out why it can happen this quickly. Um, and she had five 70 foot Scots pines on her property and they all died within two days. So this is from a friend of mine. Um, his name is Dr. Mark Harrell. He's a forest entomologist um, from the University of Nebraska Lincoln. And he is, I consider to be the United States leading expert on pine wilt. Um, this is the Nebraska Lincoln campus. This tree was inoculated with the living nematodes. And nematodes are microscopic organisms. Um, we have hundreds of species of nematodes that live in the soil, that live in plants that are totally harmless. Obviously, these are not uh, one of those species. So this tree was inoculated on August 20th. By August 25th, it was clinically dead. By September 9th, it was 100% dead. That is a period of 22 days. And the reason is that when the nematodes enter the tree, they work in association with, you remember I mentioned earlier the bark beetles that attack pine trees? The nematodes initial food source when they enter the tree is the blue or black stain fungus that is in a lot of pine trees as a result of bark beetles. And that causes their population to increase. I was on a, a TV show about trees and shrubs about eight years ago. Uh, it was a phone bank situation where we answered phone calls on trees and shrubs. And I happened to be sitting next to a, a gentleman from Michigan State University that they call the nematode guy. So we started talking between phone calls and I learned more about nematodes in 30 minutes than I'd known in my whole life. Um, this particular species of nematodes multiplies at a power of 72. So you start off with 72, it's 72 times 72. And then whatever that number is times 72 and whatever, you end up with hundreds of millions within hours. And that's what causes the blockage in the vascular system. And that's why the trees die so quickly. It is a devastating disease of mostly Scots pine. Although some Austrian pines have it, there is also people who say that Eastern white pine gets it. I am not one of those people. Eastern white pine is native to the state of Michigan. Is it possible that a highly stressed, highly weakened Eastern white pine could get pine wilt? Yes, it's a pine tree. But normally under normal conditions, the insect that vectors this disease, the insect that brings the nematodes into the tree does not attack Eastern white pine, A. B, when an Eastern white pine begins looking like this, it is the result of the bark beetle and the blue or black stain fungus. And that disease manifests itself very closely to pine wilt. It is easy to misdiagnose the two conditions. This is a condition caused by nematode populations that massively replicate. Eastern white pines die of a blue or black stain fungus that is released by maybe one bark beetle that has gotten into their tree. So it's two completely different um, situations that cause that end up causing the same effect, the blockage of the vascular tissue. Um, does it matter if it's pine wilt or if it's blue or black stain? Yes, it does. It definitely does. Because if you have a lot of Scots pines in close proximity, the insect that vectors this um, nematode, this species of nematode, will go to those trees. Both the, the Sawyer beetle, which is the vector for this disease, 
and the red turpentine beetle, which is the vector for the blue and black stained fungus, they both don't like to fly. They like to stay very close to home. And so if there is another tree of the same species in close proximity, they will find it. So on the left is the pine sawyer beetle. The pine sawyer beetle is a longhorn beetle that is native um, to Michigan. And unfortunately, it feeds in these trees and it picks up this microscopic organism on the right. And this is called the pine wood nematode. And the nematode will enter the beetle's mouth. And the end result is this. This is a laser dissection. And I'm sorry if I'm doing this after you guys have had dinner. Uh, but this is a laser dissection of a Sawyer beetle. This is his thorax. And those are nematodes. And you can see that every opening in this beetle's thorax is full of these nematodes. So what ends up happening is as the beetle is feeding, he is exhaling. And he is exhaling these nematodes into your Scots pine. And they, each one, each one multiplies at a power of 72. So you can see what could happen here. And that's why those trees die so quickly. So before I go on from here, there is a treatment, but you cannot treat an infected tree. You can only prevent this disease. If you have a Scots pine, I recommend you do it because the treatment lasts for three years. So it's not something that needs to be done every year. We inject a product into the tree that is actually used in dogs flea collars and it repels the nematodes and kills them as they are being deposited by the beetle. Um, it's highly effective. It's, an, it's a uh, product called abamectin, and it can produce upwards of 90% effectiveness, but we have to do it on healthy trees. We cannot do it on any tree that's already been infected. So once your tree is infected with these nematodes, it's going to die. All right, so I wanted to throw this in here because I want people to understand that there are times when pines um, shed their needles. Evergreen is probably the worst name for conifers um, and broadleaf evergreens is a terrible name because these plants are not evergreen. They all have cyclic ability and cyclic instinct to shed needles. A lot of them hold them for three or four years. Some hold them for two or three. Others hold them for five or six. But for example, if you've ever walked up to a hedge of Arbor Vitae and opened them up, you've looked in there at just giant piles of orange released leaflets. And that is a normal process for all evergreens. And in the case of these conifers, these are Eastern white pine. They do this on a cycle that is completely normal. What are you looking at here? You are looking at the internal needle shedding. A conifer should never lose that year's growth. So if you're looking out on the ends and all the needles are still green, then your tree is doing okay. This happens in the fall and this year, you probably won't see very much of it because there was so much moisture that trees are not going to shed a lot of needles. They're not gonna to have to because they have plenty of ability to store water. But conifers, unlike deciduous trees, have a much more primitive vascular system. And so they shed needles on a pretty regular basis. In some years, you just happen to notice it more. It just seems like more needles are affected. But this is a normal process. As long as it's happening only internally to the tree and the new growth candles are unaffected, then, and it's August, September, uh, excuse me, September, October, um, it's a normal time of the year for that to be occurring. Don't think your tree is dying because it's not. All right, so this is where they hold 
pine. Now I've, I've put a lot of different species in here um, and I did that to show you the differences. Um, you have two years, Eastern white pine um, is a two year tree. Scots pine is variable. They will shed needles at two years, three years and four years. You never know when they're gonna shed their needles. Japanese black pine, lace bark, red pine, Swiss stone, you don't see very much in, around Michigan. Uh, the red pine is farther up north in very sandy soil conditions. There are a few around here, but not very many. Um, and then, of course, the mugo pine. So this is what um, pine trees do, and this is all completely normal. All right. So at the end of every presentation that I talk about insects and diseases, I talk about this one because this could be the single most devastating disease that's ever hit the state of Michigan with regards to trees. And everyone who lives in the state can do something about it. You guys can stop this disease. You have the ability to stop the most virulent disease and potentially the most devastating vascular disease that has ever occurred in the state of Michigan. It is called oak wood. It's a fungus very similar to Dutch elm disease. Um, and the tree responds to it in a similar fashion. It's a little more complex than Dutch elm disease, but it can be passed by that root grafting process. Um, and it can be passed overland. There are six to eight species of a little tiny beetle called the picnic beetle that transports this fungus. The beetle feeds in, a, in an area of a tree called the pressure pad. This is where the disease has formed. And it's actually a physical pad that forms inside the bark of the tree. And as it grows, it causes the bark of the tree to split. And it's very sweet smelling. And it draws this tiny little beetle and he just scratches at it a little. He doesn't do a lot of feeding. He's not destructive to the tree, but he gets it on his legs and his mouth parts. Then he goes to an unaffected tree and unfortunately deposits the fungus. As the fungus grows within the tree, the water conductive tissue of the tree is blocked the leaves begin to wilt and fall off the tree. Once the tree is infected, there is no control. There is no cure for this disease. With Dutch elm disease, you can prevent it. We are working. Um, actually, I shouldn't say we because I'm not involved in it, but Michigan State is experimenting with some fungicides trunk injecting fungicides into the trees, see if any work at what rates they work at. So far, it's been rather disappointing. Um, there's been one that showed promise, but it's been, it has to be injected at such an incredibly high rate that it could theoretically kill the tree. Um, and so that's probably not going to work either. So oaks in the red oak group are the most have absolutely zero resistance now for all intents and purposes in michigan there are basically two groups of oak trees white oak and red oak the red oak group has zero resistance to this disease the red oak group contains black um, northern reds northern pin oaks and some others i think chinkapin oak is a red oak um, they get this disease extremely easily. Oaks in the white oak group, for whatever reason, are less susceptible. They get it, but for some reason, the white oak is able to fight it off and hold it at bay for a while. Um, and so they don't die right away. A red oak infected with oak wilt um, will last probably no longer than three to four weeks at the outside. So white oaks are, are obviously the white oak, the swamp white, the bur oak, and there are others in that group also. But the most common around Metro Detroit, southeastern Michigan is the white, the swamp white, and the bur oak. So the difference is basically red oaks, and I, I'm sure I have a picture of it here. Red oaks have 
pointed leaves. White oaks have rounded leaves. So this disease moves through the vascular system. It's vectored very similarly to um, Dutch elm disease. We call it new infection centers are created by the beetle. And then red oaks, if you have 20 red oaks all in an area, it's passed through the root system of the tree to other red oaks. Um, and it can move very quickly. New infection centers are caused by the sap feeding beetle. Um, as I said, the pressure pad under the bark or the mat forces the bark to split open. And when that happens, the, the spore pad of the disease that's on the tree smells a lot like juicy fruit gum. It's very sweet. And so that draws the beetle. So the beetle is basically drawn to any tree that has fresh wounds. Why is that? Because trees have two conductive tissues. One carries water up the tree, it's called the xylem tissue. And one carries the converted sugars and carbohydrates. Water goes up the tree out into the leaves through an amazing process called photosynthesis. That leaf takes six molecules of sunlight and six molecules of water and six molecules of carbon dioxide and converts it into its food, which are sugars, carbohydrates, and proteins. And then it sends it back down the root system to back down the phloem tissue to the root system. And that's how a tree grows. Trees are food, self-producing food. Fertilizer is not food for a tree. It's mineral content that trees need. Trees feed themselves through this process of photosynthesis, right? So when this happens, any fresh wound that occurs on the tree exposes that phloem tissue because the phloem tissue is actually on the outside, right under the bark. In fact, every year, that phloem tissue becomes the new bark. That's how trees grow outward. They expand. Phloem tissue turns into bark. Xylem tissue turns into structure wood, right? And so that's how those tree rings are formed in a tree. So because that phloem tissue contains sugars and carbohydrates, it's very sweet. And that draws the beetle as well. So the beetle comes from a pressure pad that is actually the spores of the disease, gets it on its mouth parts and its feet and claws, and goes to a tree with a fresh wound because it smells sweet there too, and deposits the fungus directly into the vascular tissue of the tree. Fresh wounds here is really important, folks. Most oak wood moves from disease trees to healthy trees through root grafting. Species of the same trees will root graft. Rarely, occasionally, a red oak will graft with a white oak, but that doesn't happen very often. But if, like I said, you have a stand of red oaks that contain 15 or 20 red oaks, it only takes one of those red oaks to be visited by that beetle, have him deposit the fungus, and within a week or two, that fungus has traveled down into the root system and is now moving through root grafts to all the trees that were root grafted to that one tree. That's why this disease is so devastating. So once infected, the trees in the red oak die within usually three weeks. White oaks last a little longer. There is no chemical control for infected trees. An infected tree is going to die. The best defense against oak wilt is to not create wounds on oaks because that beetle can be drawn to a fresh wound within five minutes. Five minutes. So I said earlier that everyone here has a chance to Slow. 
slow down the movement of this disease. Work if you have storm damage and a branch breaks. If that happens, the tree company needs to paint the cut on the tree where they cleaned up the break in, in the limb. It is extremely important that all open wounds on an oak tree be painted because that beetle will be drawn immediately to that fresh wound. If you have to take down an oak because it becomes a hazard during the growing season, that stump needs to be ground out that day or it needs to be painted. Here's what happens. When the, when the stump of a tree realizes a tree is gone, trees have a community relationship. And all trees within a stand know that other trees are there. And so when a tree dies and is taken down, the stump knows the tree is no longer there and releases everything it has into the soil. So the other trees in the community have sugars, carbohydrates, enzymes, proteins, water, all of that is released from the root system. If that tree was infected with oak wilt, it will release that fungus into the soil as well. And that would be devastating to other red oaks that are within the root zone of that tree. So please do not prune your oaks during the growing season. It is the single best way to stop this disease. Why is that important? We remember most of us are old enough to remember, or I probably just dated myself, that Dutch elm disease was extremely virulent in the 60s. I lived in Royal Oak and we lived on a street that had, was covered with American elms. They were boulevard trees all the way from 12 mile to 13 mile road. By the time I was in junior high school, there wasn't one left. But American elms only accounted for 0.05% of Michigan trees. They were imported and specifically grown as urban trees because they grew so well and produced such a great canopy. But they, in volume wise, only represented half of 1%, 0.05%. Oaks account for 30% of Michigan trees. If we allow this disease to go unchecked, we stand to lose 30% of the trees that are currently growing in Michigan. That would be absolutely devastating. So what am I talking about? This is Michigan's oak resource right here. This is what Michigan has as far as oaks. And you can see in the Upper Peninsula is a little different. Oaks only grow where there's water by the Great Lakes in the Upper Peninsula, but internally in the Southern Peninsula, in, in the Lower Peninsula, oaks grow internally within the state because of the number of inland lakes that are in Michigan and the groundwater table is much shallower down here than it is in the UP. So we have a lot of inland oaks as well. We cannot afford to lose 30% of our trees. The state's environmental conditions would change dramatically. There are over 20 insects that live in concert with oak trees. There are six species of birds that build their nests almost exclusively in oak trees. There are 40 species of understory trees, perennials and shrubs that grow within the root zones of oaks. All of that would disappear. So we wouldn't lose just 30% of our trees, but we would lose all of that understory and probably the species of animals who would not have time to adapt to a new environment. So we could stand to not only change our environment in the short term, but over the long term, not just our grandkids, but their grandkids. Michigan could theoretically never be the same if we lose 30% of our trees. This is where oak wilt is as of um, 2016. You can see it's occurring a lot in the upper lower peninsula. It's because of lot clearing um, that has been going on for new subdivisions. And they are, are clear cutting, but unfortunately they are not um, taking care of the stumps on a quick enough basis. And so as a result, um, the damage is significant. You go up to Traverse City, and the number of dead oaks is mind-boggling. 
Um, so it's, it's a situation that we can control just as normal citizens. And it's something that we say that we need to do. Do not prune oaks during the growing season. We have 50% of this state is still covered by one of four major forest ecosystems. The Jack Pine Forest, the Boreal Forest, Oak Hickory, and Northern Hardwoods. Oaks are part of three of those four forests. We cannot stand to lose 30% of our oaks because then we would lose significantly more of those three forest groups. We can, uh, oaks comprise over 2 billion cubic feet of Michigan's forest. This state would never recover from that. So if you have bridge clubs, if you have church groups, uh, Girl Scouts, Cub Scouts, whatever groups you have, and anyone starts talking trees, talk oak wool and talk about not pruning trees, not pruning oaks during the growing season. If you don't know if you have oaks, then please hire a certified arborist um, to come out and take a look and determine if you have oaks. That'll help you, let you know how to take care of them and make sure that they are not pruned during the growing season. This problem is spreading right now. It is not out of control, but it potentially could get there. This needs to be put under control and the average citizen of the state of Michigan has the ability to contribute to stopping this disease. Lastly, when you are dealing with trees on your property, it's really important that you hire people that are certified professionals. And the reason is, is there's a lot of people out there that will tell you all kinds of things about trees and shrubs that are not true. Um, they care more about your checking account and your credit cards than they do about your trees. So these are two certifications. The one on the left is the International Society of Arboriculture Certified Arborist Program. Um, the one on the right is the Michigan Department of um, agriculture and rural developments certified pesticide applicator. Anyone who comes on your property and applies pesticides for hire in the state of Michigan, in other words, is charging you to apply pesticides, has to be certified. This is my card. I am certified in 3A, which is lawns, 3B, trees and shrubs, 6, which is right of way, like working on the Woodward median or something like that. 7A, which is general pest management and 7F, which is mosquitoes. So they need to have this and you have every right within the law to ask to see that card when someone comes on your property to apply pesticide. And I highly recommend that you use certified arborists when you have questions regarding trees you have a much higher chance of getting the truth. Thank you very much. I see we might have a couple questions up at the top here. Yeah, thanks Gary. Well, um, one follow-up question on oak will is if an oak tree was cut down several years ago, but the stump was not removed or painted, should anything be done at this point? No. Now, if the wood's going to rot and decay, oak wilt needs a living host. Um, and so if, if the trees in the surrounding area have not died yet, they're not going to. Okay. Um, another question about books on funguses and insects that affect trees. Um, what would you recommend for uh, well, I, homeowners? I, I that saw are... this one and I've got... Um, Oh, geez. There are two books out there. Um, one is called Insects of Trees and Shrubs, and the other one is called Diseases of Trees and Shrubs. They are either on their 12th or 14th edition. The downside to these books, and I'll be completely honest with you, the downside is they are about 120 bucks a piece. They're about three inches thick and they are the absolute definitive books on insects and diseases of trees and shrubs, but they are outrageously expensive. Um, the best way I have found a lot of information with regards to um, fungus is to Google that very question. 
books on insects and diseases. Um, and you're going to get a, quite a collection. There's some really good books out there. Okay. Um, I'm drawing a blank on names at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunate. Um, not sure how much time, you know, this could be a whole nother topic on gypsy moth, but do you have any quick comments? Sure. Um, gypsy moth have gotten bad. This is very, this is a very common situation. Um, insects are cyclic and it's not a question of the state of Michigan has failed us. They're not spraying. This is, this is totally normal for all insects to, of course, the state of Michigan did spray for quite a while and drove the populations down significantly. Now they're starting to bounce back and that is completely normal. The, the problem is, is they are an absolute mess when they get going and total defoliation. Now, trees have to be totally defoliated for three, four, five years before they become stressed enough to be affected by that defoliation. In other words, they are not going to die if they've been affected one year. There is, um, they are very easy to control because these insects feed constantly. So they're eating 24 seven. There are organic problem, products that are very effective. I have seen, in some cases, better control with the organic product called Bacillus thuringius than I have with some synthetic pesticides. There is also another one called Conserve, which is a um, spinosad, which is an organic um, product also that can be applied and they are highly effective. The key to it is the smaller the caterpillar, the better the control. So you want to get gypsy moth. You want to treat for gypsy moth very early in the season. They actually hatch at 250 growing degree days. You can go to Michigan State University in Viro Weather. It is run by their extension service. In the search box, you can put in gypsy moth and it will tell you when to begin your treatments. So it's a really, really good program. Um, but usually one application done at the right time will control a massive amount of gypsy moth. They are not hard to control because they're eating constantly. Very good, thanks. Um, what about uh, the emerald ash borer? Um, trees that are still alive, will they eventually succumb? I haven't seen a lot of failure recently in ashes that are still alive. Um, that's because oh, most of those ashes have been treated. My personal belief is if you have an ash that has survived the onslaught that was the 90s and early 2000s, late 90s, early 2000s, it will probably survive. Emerald ash borer is nowhere near at the population levels it was then. And our natural predators are finding woodpeckers, parasites. Um, they've introduced a parasitic wasp um, that controls it. I have not seen an adult emerald ash borer in three or four years. So I'm thinking um, that as long as your ashes don't get stressed by drought or any other kind of, of event, that you're probably going to be okay. Well, thank you. I am going to add the um, link for the Google form in the chat if you are interested in ISA or and or SAF credits. Um, you can fill that out. Um, and we'll have a couple more minutes if anybody has additional questions to send in. All right, tell folks. So thanks a lot for, um, we had a good crowd. There was like 35 or 40 people there. Yeah.